Is sugar destroying your brain or is it absolutely key to energy and keeping you feeling well? Is there a difference between honey and cane sugar versus something like aspartame or stevia or high fructose corn syrup? And maybe most importantly, what does any of this mean when it comes to your brain? I'm Dr. Austin Promoter. I help you to understand brain science and how to use that brain science to improve and protect your brain health. This podcast, this episode is going to be all about the science behind sugar and how different forms of sugar and sweeteners influence our brain state. We'll be unpacking the real science, not just the spin, behind everything from stevia to sucralose and aspartame to a number of sweeteners that you might not have even heard about. And I will give you my thoughts and what I personally consume as it relates to sweeteners in the diet. Now, quick disclaimer before we get started, this is just for education purposes. This is not a replacement for medical advice. And if you have a medical concern, you should speak with your healthcare practitioner and not take advice from anybody online, including me. This is also my podcast where my goal is to share practical information with everyone who might be interested in learning about how to improve their brain health. So if this is interesting to you, please subscribe, please like, it helps me tremendously. Let's jump right in. Sugar is among the most popular villains when it comes to nutritional health conversations. But depending on how you hear about sugar, you may have heard that it's everything from absolutely harmless in moderation to some people saying that it's like cocaine because it's so addictive. So what is it? Is sugar just another harmless indulgence or is it secretly sabotaging your brain health? When it comes to brain health and the effect of sugar on our cognitive and mental state, we're learning that there is important nuance to the conversation, and there are fundamental differences between different forms of sugar and sweeteners. So let's dive into the specific and latest research on sugar and sweeteners effects on our brains and what these sweeteners are really doing to our cognitive and our mental health. First question, how does sugar relate to the brain at all? Like it or not, and despite what you see on TV or read about, our brains desperately need sugar. Yes, I'll say that again. Our brains love and need sugar. Now, I wanna be very clear. What we're talking about here is glucose, blood sugar. That is not the same thing as table sugar. But glucose in particular is the primary fuel source for our neurons and for our glial cells. Our brains thrive on sugar. Now, there are some caveats to this. For certain people who are on a long fast or who are consuming extra ketone bodies or who are doing a very low carbohydrate diet, there is a higher percentage of our brain fuel that is being derived from what are called ketone bodies. For most people and for most of the time, however, our brains are running predominantly on glucose, which we also call blood sugar. But while glucose powers our brain function, there are several key steps that separate the sugar that we consume in our diet from the sugar that is being used by our brains, which comes through our bloodstream. Here's the important catch. You don't need added sugar for brain power. I'm going to say that again. In order to power your brain, you don't need to be eating and especially not drinking added sugar. Your body can synthesize glucose from carbohydrates. It can make glucose from other forms of fuels. You basically can break down carbohydrates and create glucose from those fuel sources, or you can actually create glucose, gluconeogenesis, from amino acids and from proteins. This means that we don't need to be consuming added sugar in our food in order to benefit our brain by way of producing glucose in our bloodstream. And really important to understand, the sugar in our food may be doing more harm than good. So the key takeaway here first is that added sweeteners, which are found in 70 plus percent of the foods and beverages in the United States, are unnecessary as it relates to most people's brain health. There are some very specific instances where these things may be helpful, but for most people and most of the time, we do not benefit from having added sweeteners or sugars in the foods and beverages that we consume. So as we approach this conversation about sugar and other sweeteners, I'll just say this, and it may ruffle some feathers, no sugars are really needed, no sweeteners are really needed for health. However, they can add a lot of color and add a lot of flavor to our foods. 
But that is different from saying that we need these molecules, that we need these things specifically found in, in an added form in our foods and beverages for our health. So why are sugars and sweeteners concerning for brain health? Well, a host of research over the last decades shows that there are pathways connecting added sugars and sweeteners with worse health outcomes. And these include worse mental health, worse behavioral health, worse cognitive health outcomes around our brains. This isn't just about weight gain or blood sugar spikes, the popular things that we see, which is, oh, you don't want to eat too much sugar because you will gain fat, or you don't want to eat too much sugar because it'll spike your blood sugar. While those are parts of the conversation, what I want to focus on right here is added sugar and sweeteners as it relates to brain health and the potential for brain damage. At the core of this work around brain health and added sweeteners and sugars, it is important to understand that these molecules, when consumed, again, in an added form, this is different from saying that you have naturally occurring sugars that are found in, let's say, an apple, but added sugars and sweeteners appear to preferentially induce metabolic dysfunction, inflammation, oxidative stress, and alter the gut microbiome in a negative way. These effects vary depending on the type of sweetener that's being used. Some of these sweeteners seem to cause significant harm. Others may be quite benign. And there is even a subset of sweeteners, which we'll talk about in this video, that may have some benefit to metabolic health. However, this is a very early set of research, and it's still going to be something we need to further explore. A little bit about some of the specific forms of sweetener and what they may do for the brain. First up, let's talk about natural sugars and sugar-rich concentrates. So what am I talking about when I reference these molecules? The most popular sweeteners that we use in our diet that are incredibly pervasive continue to be sugar and sugary food concentrates. So this includes cane sugar, molasses, honey, maple sugar, coconut sugar, high fructose corn syrup, agave, and so many others. There are so many ways that these natural sugars are disguised and dressed up and then packed into our foods and beverages. But the key molecules are going to be glucose and fructose that are the main sugars in these types of concentrates and sweeteners. And high levels of consumption of glucose and fructose in their added form are linked to mental and cognitive decline. I'm going to say this again. Glucose and fructose, when consumed in their refined form, when added to foods, this is linked to mental and cognitive decline. And I'll give an example here. High fructose corn syrup is really only a little bit more fructose than it is glucose, whereas sucrose is about 50% glucose and fructose. So any permutation of glucose and fructose when in an added sweetened form is something that we want to avoid. And you can call it agave syrup, or you can call it molasses syrup, or you can call it cane sugar, or you can call it high fructose corn syrup. The bottom line is these are things we'd want to try to avoid. These sweeteners tend to require some degree of concentration prior to creating a finished product. And they tend to be used in ultra processed foods, which are the foods most strongly correlated with brain decline. Generally speaking, consuming these natural products in larger quantities is believed to elevate the risk for dementia and mental health issues. One recent study found that depression risk increased by almost 30% in those consuming over 100 grams of added sugar per day. Now, is this a dose makes the poison scenario? Sure. If you have a couple of grams of added sugar a day, that's not a huge concern. But what we're seeing is that most people consume far, far more of added sugars than what I just described. And typical sodas will consume 30, maybe 40 grams of added sugar in just one beverage. There are differences in the specific makeup of product in this group, these foods and beverages with added natural sweeteners in terms of glucose to fructose ratios. But I'll say this main point, which is we are wise to avoid foods and beverages that have more than a few grams of added sugars. In a perfect world, we're actually eating foods with zero grams of added sugar. There is really no need for us beyond the palatability component to be eating and drinking foods with added sugars. So even though this may not always be feasible, it's important to remember that we're not actually needing that added sugar. There is one caveat to this, and it's a small caveat, and I'll talk about why it isn't something that we should generalize, but honey in particular 
seems to be rich in other nutrients like polyphenols, and there is some data suggesting there may be potential even brain benefits from consumption of some of these nutrients found in honey. But I want to be very clear on this. Honey is still very rich in these glucose and fructose sugars. So I am not recommending people start consuming more honey for the benefit, but I am saying that in comparison to other forms of natural sweeteners, there may be something more to honey, and it may be one of the least problematic of the natural sweeteners. The next category of sweeteners I'd like to discuss are sugar alcohols. And sugar alcohols have been getting a lot of play and conversation recently. These are molecules like erythritol, xylitol, mannitol, things that end in oal. So this oal is actually a suffix that is a chemical term for an alcohol. Sugar alcohols are generally less sweet than typical sugar sweeteners. They're also lower in calorie count and they don't tend to spike blood sugar as significantly as standard caloric sweeteners. Sugar alcohols have become very popular in the keto and the low carb movements, but it's important to note that excess consumption of sugar alcohols may not be so great for our brains and for our bodies. At higher levels, we're talking 30 to 50 grams a day, sugar alcohols may create GI issues. And there are some recent studies, which even though they're not incredibly helpful because of how they're done, there are suggestions that erythritol and other sugar alcohols may actually increase risk for blood, uh, blood vessel function in our brains and therefore increase risk for a stroke. I want to bring up one point here, which is because these sugar alcohols are less sweet per gram than conventional natural sweeteners, they tend to be at very high concentrations in the foods that we would consume. So when you look at the label of that food or beverage and you see the sugar alcohol grams, it's still worthy of our consideration when we're getting to these higher levels, again, 30 to 50 grams a day of sugar alcohols. And personally, I'm not completely sugar alcohols. However, I don't try to prioritize foods with sugar alcohols. Okay, let's now move to maybe the most contentious of the categories of sweeteners, artificial sweeteners. As of 2025, the FDA has approved six artificial sweeteners for our food supply. That includes things like aspartame and sucralose and neotame. While these sweeteners don't spike blood sugar, they may have their own set of risks. And some of the concerns around artificial sweeteners relate to mainly preclinical animal research suggesting the potential for cancer and other risks. In humans, the primary outcome of the existing research is a suggestion for alterations in the gut microbiome if we are to consume these molecules. But the gut-brain connection is very powerful. Altering the microbiome could be damaging our brain. So artificial sweeteners and sugar alcohols uh, are both components of ultra-processed foods. These are things that, in general, kind of come along with a diet that is rich in things that may not be all that advantageous to our health. So to summarize here on artificial sweeteners, yes, there's some data, including neurotransmitters and other potential brain-specific issues that come from preclinical data on artificial sweeteners, but what I've seen more of is a concern for gut health as a function of consuming these, again, mostly in preclinical data. And the biggest reason why I personally avoid artificial sweeteners is simply that their presence almost always indicates that a food is a highly processed or ultra processed food, which as I mentioned, are the foods that are most strongly associated with worse brain health. Let's now move to the last category here, which is natural low calorie sweeteners. So. These are molecules, sweeteners that have gained publicity in recent years. Uh, they're approved by the FDA. Things that might be examples for, that you may be familiar with would be monk fruit extract, stevia, and allulose. What do we know about these sweeteners? There's not much data that they are a risk to brain health. And there is some data that some of the pathways acted on by these sweeteners, for example, stevia, allulose, may be beneficial to gut health and potentially even beneficial to metabolism and by extension, may be providing some advantages to the brain. However, we're still very early in the research around these molecules. And I think that it's important to note here that we need additional data to see whether these types of research studies hold up over time with larger samples, specifically in human trials. So let's put all of this together. What do we do with this information? The bottom line is that for most people, you're consuming too much sweetener. 
any form of sweetener programs the brain to seek sweet. And even the healthier alternatives can keep us hooked on sugar, fueling cravings for sweetened foods and drinks. While standard sugar and sweeteners may add these what we would call empty calories that also contribute to inflammation, metabolic dysfunction, fundamental to the understanding of why we're having an issue with sweet in general is that we have ramped up our consumption of sweet to where we expect everything we consume to be sweet. If we are going to be choosing between the existing options of natural sweetener, honey may be the best bet for conventional sweetener, while allulose, monk fruit, and stevia may be the best bet for low calorie sweeteners. But the healthiest option is ideally the one that allows us to resensitize ourselves to sweet so we're not so dependent on eating everything and drinking everything that is sweetened. Now we've touched on a lot of different topics within this context of discussing sweetened beverages, sweetened foods, and various forms of sweeteners that we can be consuming. I want to nail down the key points. Point number one is that consuming a diet rich in sweeteners typically is a diet that is an ultra processed diet, and that is the diet we want to avoid. Point two is that while there is some data suggesting that artificial sweeteners may not be so good for our health, there is far more data suggesting that consumption of high levels of natural sweeteners is problematic to our health. This doesn't mean that you should consume artificial sweeteners, but it is important to note that in the spectrum, we know that eating more natural sweeteners provides calories, metabolic dysfunction, and inflammation. And so I would say that we should make sure to avoid consuming high levels of the added sweeteners that come from natural sources just as much as we should be avoiding some of those artificial sweeteners. The last point I'll make here is that while there are healthier alternatives, stevia, monk fruit, allulose, as of now, we're still trying to pool the research to see if there is a strong signal that these are better options. And the best bet, in my opinion, is to decrease your dependence on sweet foods and beverages altogether. I'm Dr. Austin Perlmutter. If you've enjoyed this conversation, I invite you to follow along on this podcast by subscribing. Leave me a like, leave me a comment. It lets me know that you're paying attention, that this is interesting to you. Thank you so much for listening in, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.